Chapter Four of Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikibu, translated by Suyematsu Kencho. Chapter Four, Evening Glory, Part One. It happened that when Genji was driving about. In the Rokjio quarter, he was informed that his old nurse Daini was ill and had become a nun. Her residence was in Gojio. He wished to visit her and drove to the house. The main gate was closed, so that his carriage could not drive up. Therefore, he sent in a servant to call out Koremitsu, the son of the nurse. Meantime, while awaiting him, he looked round on the deserted terrace. He noticed close by a small and rather dilapidated dwelling with a wooden fence round a newly made enclosure. The upper part, for eight or ten yards in length, was surrounded by a trellis work over which some white reed blinds, rude but new, were thrown. Through these blinds, the indistinct outline of some fair heads were faintly delineated, and the owners were evidently peeping down the roadway from their retreat ah thought genji they can never be so tall as to look over the blind they must be standing on something within but whose residence is it what sort of people are they his equipage was strictly private and unostentatious there were of course no outriders hence he had no fear of being recognized by them and so he still watched the house the gate was also constructed of something like trellis work and stood half open revealing the loneliness of the interior the line where do we seek our home came first into his mind and he then thought that even this must be as comfortable as golden palaces to its inmates a long wooden rail covered with luxuriant creepers which fresh and green climbed over it in full vigour arrested his eye their white blossoms one after another disclosing their smiling lips in unconscious beauty genji began humming to himself ah stranger crossing there when his attendant informed him that these lovely white flowers were called yugao evening glory adding and at the same time pointing to the flowers see the flowers only flourishing in that glorious state what beautiful flowers they are exclaimed genji go and beg a bunch the attendant thereupon entered the half-opened gate and asked for some of them on which a young girl dressed in a long tunic came out taking an old fan in her hand and saying let us put them on this those with strong stems plucked off a few stalks and laid them on the fan these were given to the attendant who walked slowly back just as he came near to genji the gate of koremitz's courtyard opened and koremitz himself appeared who took the flowers from him and handed them to genji at the same moment saying i am very sorry i could not find the gate key and that i made you wait so long in the public road though there is no one hereabouts to stare at or recognize you i sincerely beg your pardon the carriage was now driven in and genji alighted the ajari elder brother of koremitsu mikawa no kami his brother-in-law and the daughter of daini all assembled and greeted him the nun also rose from her couch to welcome him how pleased i am to see you she said but you see i have quite altered i have become a nun i have given up the world i had no reluctance in doing this if i had any uneasiness it was on your account alone my health however is beginning to improve evidently the divine blessing on this sacrifice i was so sorry replied genji to hear you were ill and now still more so to find you have given up the world i hope that you may live to witness my success and prosperity it grieves me to think you were compelled to make such a change yet i believe this will secure your enjoyment of happiness hereafter it is said that when one leaves this world without a single regret one passes straight to paradise as he said these words his eyes became moistened now it is common for nurses to regard their foster children with blind affection whatever may be their faults thinking so to speak that what is crooked is straight 
so in genji's case who in daini's eyes was next door to perfection this blindness was still more strongly apparent and she always regarded her office as his nurse as an honour and while genji was discoursing in the above manner a tear began to trickle from her eyes you know he continued at what an early age i was deprived of my dearest ties there were indeed several who looked after me but you were the one to whom i was most attached in due course after i grew up i ceased to see you regularly i could not visit you as often as i thought of you yet when i did not see you for a long time i often felt very lonely ah if there were no such things as partings in the world he then enjoined them earnestly to persevere in prayer for their mother's health and said good-bye at the moment of quitting the house he remembered that something was written on the fan that held the flowers it was already twilight and he asked koremitsu to bring a taper that he might see to read it it seemed to him as if the fragrance of some fair hand that had used it still remained and on it was written the following couplets the crystal dew at evening's hour sleeps on the yugao's beauteous flower will this please him whose glances bright gave to the flowers a dearer light with apparent carelessness without any indication to show who the writer was it bore however the marks of a certain excellence genji thought this is singular coming from whence it does and turning to koremitsu he asked who lives in this house to your right ah exclaimed koremitsu mentally as usual i see but replied with indifference truly i have been here some days but i have been so busy in attending my mother that i neither know nor have asked about the neighbours you may probably be surprised at my inquisitiveness said genji but i have reasons for asking this on account of this fan i request you to call on them and make inquiries what sort of people they are koremitsu thereupon proceeded to the house and calling out a servant sought from him the information he wanted when he was told that this is the house of mr yome no suke he is at present in the country his lady is still young her brothers are in the court service and often come here to see her the whole history of the family i am not acquainted with with this answer koremitz returned and repeated it to genji who thought ah the sending of this verse may be a trick of these conceited court fellows but he could not entirely free his mind from the idea of its having been sent especially to himself this was consistent with the characteristic vanity of his disposition he therefore took out a paper and disguising his handwriting lest it should be identified indited the following were i the flower to see more near which once at dusky eve i saw it might have charms for me more dear and look more beauteous than before and this he sent to the house by his servant and sent off on his way he saw a faint light through the chinks of the blinds of the house like the glimmer of the firefly it gave him as he passed a silent sort of longing the mansion in riccio to which he was proceeding this evening was a handsome building standing amidst fine woods of rare growth and beauty and all was of comfortable appearance its mistress was altogether in good circumstances and here genji spent the hours in full ease and comfort on his way home next morning he again passed the front of the house where grew the yuga flowers and the recollection of flowers which he had received the previous evening made him anxious to ascertain who the people were who lived there after the lapse of some time koremitsu came to pay him a visit excusing himself for not having come before on account of his mother's health being more unsatisfactory he said in obedience to your commands to make further inquiries i called on some people who know about my neighbours but could not get much information i was told however that there is a lady who has been living there since last may but who she is even the people in the house do not know sometimes i looked over the hedges between our gardens and saw the youthful figure of a lady and a maiden attending her in a style of dress which betrayed a good origin yesterday evening after sunset i saw the lady writing a letter her face was very calm in expression but full of thought and her attendant was often sobbing secretly as she waited on her these things i saw distinctly 
Genji smiled. He seemed more anxious than before to know something about them, and Koremitz continued. Hoping to get some fuller information, I took an opportunity which presented itself of sending a communication to the house. To this a speedy answer was returned, written by a skilful hand. I concluded from this and other circumstances that there was something worth seeing and knowing enclosed within those walls. Genji immediately exclaimed, Do! Do try again! Not to be able to find out is too provoking. And he thought to himself, If in lowly life, which is often left unnoticed, we find something attractive and fair, as Sama no Kami said, how delightful it will be, and I think, perhaps, this may be such a one. In the meantime, his thoughts were occasionally reverting to Cicada. His nature was not, perhaps, so perverted as to think about persons of such condition and position in life as Cicada, but since he had heard the discussion about women and their several classifications, he had somehow become speculative in his sentiments and ambitious of testing all those different varieties by his own experience. While matters were in this state, Iyo no Kami returned to the capital and came in haste to pay his respects to Genji. He was a swarthy, repulsive-looking man, bearing the traces of a long journey in his appearance, and of advanced age. Still there was nothing unpleasant in his natural character and manners. Genji was about to converse with him freely, but somehow or another an awkward feeling arose in his mind, and threw a restraint upon his cordiality. Io is such an honest old man, he reflected. It is too bad to take advantage of him. What Sama no Kami said is true, that to strive to carry out wrong desires is man's evil failing. Her hard-heartedness to me is unpleasant, but from the other side this deserves praise. It was announced after this that Iyo no Kami would return to his province and take his wife with him, and that his daughter would be left behind to be soon married. This intelligence was far from pleasing to Genji, and he longed once more, only once more, to behold the lady of the scarf, and he concerted with Kokimi how to arrange a plan for obtaining an interview. The lady, however, was quite deaf to such proposals, and the only concession she vouchsafed was that she occasionally received a letter and sometimes answered it. Autumn had now come. Genji was still thoughtful. Lady Aoi saw him but seldom and was constantly disquieted by his protracted absence from her. There was, as we have before hinted at Rokjio, another person whom he had won with great difficulty, and it would have been a little inconsistent if he became too easily tired of her. He indeed had not become cool towards her, but the violence of his passion had somewhat abated. The cause of this seems to have been that this lady was rather too zealous, or, we may say, jealous, besides, her age exceeded that of Genji by some years. The following incident will illustrate the state of matters between them. One morning early, Genji was about to take his departure with sleepy eyes, listless and weary, from her mansion at Rokjio. A slight mist spread over the scene. A maiden attendant of the mistress opened the door for his departure and led him forth. The shrubbery of flowering trees struck refreshingly on the sight with interlacing branches in rich confusion, among which was some asagao in full blossom. Genji was tempted to dally and looked contemplatively over them. The maiden still accompanied him. She wore a thin silk tunic of light green colors, showing off her graceful waist and figure which it covered. Her appearance was attractive. Genji looked at her tenderly and led her to a seat in the garden and sat down by her side. Her countenance was modest and quiet. Her wavy hair was neatly and prettily arranged. Genji began humming in a low tone. The heart that roams from flower to flower would fain its wanderings not betray. Yet Asagao in morning's hour impels my tender wish to stray. So saying, he gently took her hand. She, however, without appearing to understand his real meaning, answered thus, You stay not till the mist be o'er, but hurry to depart. Say, can the flower you leave no more detain your changeful heart? At this juncture, a young attendant in Sasinuki entered the garden, brushing away the dewy mist from the flowers, and began to gather some bunches of asagao. The scene was one which we might desire to paint, so full of quiet beauty, 
and Genji rose from his seat and slowly passed homeward. In those days Genji was becoming more and more an object of popular admiration in society, and we might even attribute the eccentricity of some of his adventures to the favor he enjoyed, combined with his great personal attractions. Where beautiful flowers expand their blossoms, even the rugged mountaineer loves to rest under the shade, so wherever Genji showed himself, people sought his notice. Now with regard to the fair one about whom Koremitz was making inquiries, after some still further investigations, he came to Genji and told him that there is some one who often visits there. Who he was I could not at first find out, for he comes with the utmost privacy. I made up my mind to discover him, so one evening I concealed myself outside the house and waited. Presently the sound of an approaching carriage was heard, and the inmates of the house began to peep out. The lady I mentioned before was also to be seen. I could not see her very plainly, but I can tell you so much. She looked charming. The carriage itself was now seen approaching, and it apparently belonged to some one of rank. A little girl who was peeping out exclaimed, Ukon, look here, quick, Chiujo is coming then one older came forward rubbing her hands and saying to the child don't be so foolish don't be excited how could they tell i wondered that the carriage was a chujo's i stole forth cautiously and reconnoitred near the house there is a small stream over which a plank had been thrown by way of a bridge the visitor was rapidly approaching this bridge when an amusing incident occurred the elder girl came out in haste to meet him and was passing the bridge when the skirt of her dress caught in something and she well nigh fell into the water confound that bridge what a bad katsuragi she cried and suddenly turned pale how amusing it was you may imagine the visitor was dressed in plain style he was followed by his page whom i recognized as belonging to tô no chiujo i should like to see the same carriage interrupted genji eagerly as he thought to himself that house may be the home of the very girl to whom he tô no chiujo spoke about perhaps he has discovered her hiding place i have also made an acquaintance koremitz continued with a certain person in this house and it was through these means that i made closer observations the girl who nearly fell over the bridge is no doubt the lady's attendant but they pretend to be all on an equality even when the little child said anything to betray them by its remarks they immediately turned it off kremitz laughed as he told this adding this was an amusing trick indeed oh exclaimed genji i must have a look at them when i go to visit your mother you must manage this and with the words the picture of the evening glory rose pleasantly before his eyes now koremitsu not only was always prompt in attending to the wishes of prince genji but also by his own temperament fond of carrying on such intrigues he tried every means to favor his designs and to ingratiate himself with the lady and at last succeeded in bringing her and genji together the details of the plans by which all this was brought about are too long to be given here genji visited her often but it was with the greatest caution and privacy he never asked her when they met any particulars about her past life nor did he reveal his own to her he would not drive to her in his own carriage and koremitsu often lent him his own horse to ride he took no attendant with him except the one who had asked for the evening glory he would not even call on the nurse lest it might lead to discoveries the lady was puzzled at his reticence she would sometimes send her servant to ascertain if possible what road he took and where he went but somehow by chance or design he always became lost to her watchful eye his dress also was of the most ordinary description and his visits were always paid late in the evening to her all this seemed like the mysteries of old legends true she conjectured from his demeanour and ways that he was a person of rank but she never ascertained exactly who he was she sometimes reproached koremitsu for bringing her into such strange circumstances but he cunningly kept himself aloof from such taunts be this as it may genji still frequently visited her though at the same time he was not unmindful that this kind of adventure was scarcely consistent with his position the girl was simple and modest in nature not certainly manoeuvring 
neither was she stately or dignified in mien but everything about her had a peculiar charm and interest impossible to describe and in the full charm of youth not altogether void of experience but by what charm in her thought genji am i so strongly affected no matter i am so and thus his passion continued her residence was only temporary and this genji soon became aware of if she leaves this place thought he and i lose sight of her for when this may happen is uncertain what shall i do he at last decided to carry her off secretly to his own mansion in nijio true if this became known it would be an awkward business but such are love affairs always some dangers to be risked he therefore fondly entreated her to accompany him to some place where they could be freer her answer however was that such a proposal on his part only alarmed her genji was amused at her girlish mode of expression and earnestly said which of us is a fox i don't know but anyhow be persuaded by me and after repeated conversations of the same nature she at last half consented he had much doubt of the propriety of inducing her to take this step nevertheless her final compliance flattered his vanity he recollected very well the tokonatsu pinks which tô no chiujo spoke of but never betrayed that he had any knowledge of that circumstance it was on the evening of the fifteenth of august when they were together the moonlight streamed through the crevices of the broken wall to genji such a scene was novel and peculiar the dawn at length began to break and from the surrounding houses the voices of the farmers might be heard talking one remarked how cool it is another there is not much hope for our crops this year my carrying business i do not expect to answer responded the first speaker but are our neighbors listening conversing in this way they proceeded to their work had the lady been one to whom surrounding appearances were important she might have felt disturbed but she was far from being so and seemed as if no outward circumstance could trouble her equanimity which appeared to him an admirable trait the noise of the threshing of the corn came indistinctly to their ears like distant thunder the beating of the bleacher's hammer was also heard faintly from afar off they were in the front of the house they opened the window and looked out on the dawn in the small garden before their eyes was a pretty bamboo grove their leaves wet with dew shone brilliantly even as bright as in the gardens of the palace the cricket sang cheerfully in the old walls as if it was at their very ears and the flight of wild geese in the air rustled overhead everything spoke of rural scenes and business different from what genji was in the habit of seeing and hearing round him to him all these sights and sounds from their novelty and variety combined with the affection he had for the girl beside him had a delightful charm she wore a light dress of clear purple not very costly her figure was slight and delicate the tones of her voice soft and insinuating if she were only a little more cultivated thought he but in any case he was determined to carry her off now is the time said he let us go together the place is not very far off why so soon she replied gently as her implied consent to his proposal was thus given without much thought he on his part became bolder he summoned her maid ukon and ordered the carriage to be got ready dawn now fairly broke the cocks had ceased to crow and the voice of an aged man was heard repeating his orisons probably during his fast his days will not be many thought genji what is he praying for and while so thinking the aged mortal muttered nam to rai no doshi oh the divine guide of the future do listen to that prayer said genji turning to the girl it shows our life is not limited to this world and he hummed let us together bind our soul with vows that wu basuk has given that when this world from sight shall roll unparted we shall wake in heaven and added by miruk let us bind ourselves in love for ever the girl doubtful of the future thus replied in a melancholy tone when in my present lonely lot i feel my past has not been free from sins which i remember not i dread more what to come may be 
In the meantime a passing cloud had suddenly covered the sky, and made its face quite grey. Availing himself of this obscurity, Genji hurried her away, and led her to the carriage, where Ukon also accompanied her. They drove to an isolated mansion on the Rokjio embankment, which was at no great distance, and called out the steward who looked after it. The grounds were in great solitude, and over them lay a thick mist. The curtains of the carriage were not drawn close, so that the sleeves of their dresses were almost moistened. I have never experienced this sort of trouble before, said Genji. How painful are the sufferings of love! Oh, where the ancients tell me pray, thus led away by love's keen smart, I ne'er such morning's misty ray have felt before with beating heart. Have you ever? The lady shyly averted her face and answered, I, like the wandering moon, may roam. Who knows not if her mountain love be true or false, without a home, the mist below, the clouds above? The steward presently came out, and the carriage was driven inside the gates, and was brought close to the entrance, while the rooms were hurriedly prepared for their reception. They alighted, just as the mist was clearing away. The steward was in the habit of going to the mansion of Sadai Jin, and was well acquainted with Genji. Oh, he exclaimed as they entered, without proper attendance, and approaching near to Genji said, Shall I call in some more servants? Genji replied at once and impressively, I purposely chose a place where many people should not intrude. Don't trouble yourself and be discreet. Rice broth was served up for their breakfast, but no regular meal had been prepared. The sun was now high in the heavens. Genji got up and opened the window. The gardens had been uncared for, and had run wild. The forest surrounding the mansion was dense and old, and the shrubberies were ravaged and torn by the autumn gales, and the bosom of the lake was hidden by rank weeds. The main part of the house had been for a long time uninhabited, except the servants' quarter, where there were only a few people living. How fearful this place looks, but let no demon molest us, thought Genji and endeavor to direct the girl's attention by fond and caressing conversation, and now he began, little by little, to throw off the mask, and told her who he was, and then began humming. The flower that bloomed in evening's dew was the bright guide that led to you. She looked at him askance, replying, The dew that on the yugao lay was a false guide and led astray. Thus a faint allusion was made to the circumstances which were the cause of their acquaintance, and it became known that the verse and the fan had been sent by her attendant, mistaking Genji for her mistress' former lover. In the course of a few hours the girl became more at her ease, and later on in the afternoon Koremitsu came and presented some fruits. The latter, however, stayed with them only a short time. The mansion gradually became very quiet, and the evening rapidly approached. The inner room was somewhat dark and gloomy. Yuga was nervous. She was too nervous to remain there alone, and Genji therefore drew back the curtains to let the twilight in, staying there with her. Here the lovers remained, enjoying each other's sight and company, yet the more the evening advanced, the more timid and restless she became. So he quickly closed the casement, and she drew by degrees closer and closer to his side. At these moments he also became distracted and thoughtful. How the emperor would be asking after him, and know not where he might be? What would the lady, the jealous lady, in the neighboring mansion, think or say if she discovered their secret? How painful it would be if her jealous rage should flash forth on him! Such were the reflections which made him melancholy, and as his eyes fell upon the girl affectionately sitting beside him, ignorant of all these matters, he could not but feel a kind of pity for her. Night was now advancing, and they unconsciously dropped off to sleep, when suddenly over the pillow of Genji hovered the figure of a lady of threatening aspect. It said fiercely, You faithless one, wandering astray with such a strange girl. And then the apparition tried to pull away the sleeping girl near him. Genji awoke, much agitated. The lamp had burnt itself out. He drew his sword and placed it beside him, and called aloud for Ukon, and she came to him also quite alarmed. Do call up the servants and procure a light, said Genji. 
How can I go? Tis too dark, she replied, shaking with fear. How childish, he exclaimed, with a false laugh, and clapped his hands to call a servant. The sound echoed drearily through the empty rooms, but no servant came. At this moment he found the girl beside him was also strangely affected. Her brow was covered with great drops of cold perspiration, and she appeared rapidly sinking into a state of unconsciousness. Ah, she is often troubled with a nightmare, said Ukon, and perhaps this disturbs her now. But let us try and rouse her. Yes, very likely, said Genji. She was very much fatigued, and since noon her eyes have often been riveted upwards, like one suffering from some inward malady. I will go myself and call the servants, he continued. Clapping one's hands is useless. Besides, it echoes fearfully. Do come here, Ukon, for a little while, and look after your mistress. So pulling Ukon near Yugao, he advanced to the entrance of the saloon. He saw all was dark in the adjoining chambers. The wind was high and blew gustily round the mansion. The few servants, consisting of a son of the steward, footman, and page, were all buried in profound slumber. Genji called to them loudly, and they awoke with a start. Come, said he, bring a light. Valet, twang your bowstring, and drive away the fiend. How can you sleep so soundly in such a place? But has Koremitz come? Sir, he came in the evening, but you had given no command, and so he went away, saying he would return in the morning, answered one. The one who gave this reply was an old knight, and he twanged his bowstrings vigorously. Hyojin, Hyojin, be careful of the fire, be careful of the fire, as he walked around the rooms. The mind of Genji instinctively reverted at this moment to the comfort of the palace. At this hour of midnight, he thought, the careful knights are patrolling round its walls. How different it is here. He returned to the room he had left. It was still dark. He found Yugao lying half dead and unconscious as before, and Ukon rendered helpless by fright. What is the matter? What does it mean? What foolish fear is this? exclaimed Genji, greatly alarmed. Perhaps in lonely places like this, the fox, for instance, might try to exercise his sorcery to alarm us, but I am here. There is no cause for fear. And he pulled Ukon's sleeve as he spoke to arouse her. I am so alarmed, she replied, but my lady must be more so. Pray attend to her. Well, said Genji, and bending over his beloved, shook her gently, but she neither spoke nor moved. She had apparently fainted, and he became seriously alarmed. At this juncture the lights were brought. Genji threw a mantle over his mistress, and then called to the man to bring the light to him. The servant remained standing at a distance, according to etiquette, and would not approach. Come near, exclaimed Genji testily. Do act according to circumstances. And taking the lamp from him, threw its light full on the face of the lady, and gazed upon it anxiously. When at this very moment he beheld the apparition of the same woman he had seen before in his terrible dream float before his eyes and vanish. Ah, he cried, this is like the phantoms in old tales. What is the matter with the girl? His own fears were all forgotten in his anxiety on her account. He leaned over and called upon her, but in vain. She answered not, and her glance was fixed. What was to be done? There was no one whom he could consult. The exorcisms of a priest, he thought, might do some good, but there was no priest. He tried to compose himself with all the resolution he could summon, but his anguish was too strong for his nerves. He threw himself beside her, and embracing her passionately, cried, Come back, come back to me, my darling. Do not let us suffer such dreadful events. But she was gone. Her soul had passed gently away. The story of the mysterious power of the demon who had threatened a certain courtier, possessed of considerable strength of mind, suddenly occurred to Genji, who thought self-possession was the only remedy in present circumstances, and recovering his composure a little, said to Ukon, She cannot be dead, she shall not die yet. He then called the servant and told him, Here is one who has been strangely frightened by a vision. Go to Koremitz and tell him to come at once and if his brother, the priest, is there, ask him to come also. Tell them cautiously, don't alarm their mother. End of chapter 4, part 1 Recording by Maricel Quee.